And I thank all of our uh, panel uh, members for being here today. First, want to comment. Uh, I was just a bit surprised uh, and, frankly, a bit disappointed as well when some members of our committee are really questioning why we're, we're having this. And it seemed to be that, uh, to me, that it, we almost diverged into a, a discussion about prisons generally. And I don't uh, believe is, uh, that that is the, uh, the, the focus of our committee. Our committee is Homeland Security, and I think it's entirely appropriate that we're here today. And uh, I will go where the risk is, and I believe uh, other members of the committee will as well. So if we need to look at other areas, other groups, I'm, I'm uh, happy to do that. But uh, I, I believe that uh, radical Islamists present a, uh, a real threat, and it's appropriate that we uh, examine that today. Now, I'd like to uh, direct the first question to Mr. Downing. Uh, sir, on May 19th, uh, the committee staff visited uh, the Supermax prison where those uh, Al Qaeda members who have been captured that are held in civilian uh, prisons are, are kept and confined. And uh, the staff there observed this uh, that at the insistence of the Attorney General's uh, Department of Justice, that some Al Qaeda prisoners are allowed to have unmonitored conversations with defense attorneys then that despite repeated requests for available technology that the Bureau of Prisons and FBI have uh, requested, or at least have, would be available to them, that, uh, that that technology is not there and they're unable to monitor conversations between Al Qaeda prisoners during their recreation times. And so, Mr. Downey, um, do those policies, which are, they're not FBI policies, they're not Bureau of Prisons policies, but from coming from um, uh, the Department of Justice, do they, do they uh, degrade um, our, our safety here as, uh, as Americans and also for the personnel who work within the prisons? Well, in terms of this threat, intelligence is absolutely key. And we need to create an environment that is hostile to recruitment, uh, to uh, developing this ideology, and also to executing, uh, executing plots or planning plots. And so I think it does diminish our ability to further understand the, uh, the planning. Thank you. Uh, the second question I'd like to direct to uh, Mr. Dunleavy, and thank you again for being here. I want to revisit the letter that was sent to the chairman recently. And um, just in part, uh, it, it states this, I am a Muslim and I feel because of America's, that's America's war, it was spelled A-M-E-R-I-K-A, apostrophe S, America's war on Islam, I am an enemy of the United States. And so, uh, what, what threshold of speech must be met when a person is uh, a self-declared enemy of the United States, a self-declared person who influences others as, a, as an imam? What, what threshold has to be met before we can um, isolate that person and keep him or her from influencing others? Well, I think that, that statement in itself is, is the threshold. If you have an individual who's going to identify himself as an enemy of the United States and state that he's at war, then you have to recognize that. You have to know your enemy if you're going to effectively fight him. Well, for the record, I'm in full agreement. So I trust that this is happening within our prison system, that this gentleman, and I'm, I'm, I was uh, delighted to learn that that letter had been sent to the FBI, and I hope that he is isolated and, and there is a serious consequence uh, for the action that he's taken in the letter that he sent and what he stated. Um, any person who's to declare themselves to be an enemy of the United States um, needs to be isolated, certainly within the prison system, and uh, maybe further actions. But I thank all of you uh, for being here today, and I yield back the remainder of my time. I thank the gentleman for yielding and the gentlelady from